Um, my name is Elliot Arnold, and I am the founder and CEO of Telememory. And uh, very excited to present to this Provo group today. Admittedly, somewhat envious of your um, in-person connections there while I have to be remote and digital. But it's, it's a timely comment because the backstory of our business really um, centers around my father and my experience with my father. In 2017, my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's with dementia. And the transition from his home to an assisted living facility was very difficult. And it exposed a big problem for me. Um, and as an entrepreneur, I am sort of wired to uh, find big problems to solve. And the problem that was exposed to me was that there was no technological means of keeping my father rooted to what he knew as a person, his long-term memories, those connections that really defined who he was as a person. This transition from assisted living, I'm sorry, from his home environment to memory care um, was very disassociating. And, and, there, and as a result, a lot of anxiety and depression arose um, as part of this transition. This is a very big problem, as I mentioned a moment ago. As a matter of fact, 20% uh, of the US population over 60 experience mental health issues related to depression um, that's tied to cognitive de decline. So depression and anxiety among this population that is experiencing cognitive decline is on the rise, and it's already uh, persisting across uh, across a, a, a very decent size of this population. Now, products that foster recognition, desires, self-esteem, I call them products that address the higher order uh, needs, if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, are in very short supply. Um, the majority of the industry today focuses on um, a patient's basic needs, health um, and safety. Um, and so there are very few non-drug-based treatments for mood and behavior management. And there's also a dearth of technological means to address uh, a subject's higher order needs, those self-actualization needs um, that, that typically uh, that typically to this date, the analog persists in things like um, uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or cognitive stimulation therapy. Um, and I'll get to, uh, I'll, I'll define that in a little bit more detail in a second. So what have we built at telememory today? Our mission is to help connect seniors and their families to personalized cognitive care. We offer a product and service, that, that uses a form of cognitive behavioral therapy or cognitive stimulation therapy to essentially help um, patients and their families reminisce on, on their life experiences. We supply a commercial off-the-shelf Android-based hardware appliance, as you can see here. Here's our prototype. It looks much like the um, Echo Show or the Google Nest Hub. Um, and we also have developed mobile device software and Android-based uh, uh, software for the family to interact with the hardware appliance on. Um, in addition to that, we supply curated content that's built off of biographical information that we collect. And we also provide telemental health services. Um, um, with our telepresence features, we can uh, enable a family to work with a social worker, psychiatrist, or psychologist in a digital and remote context with their loved one um, to essentially perform some of this reminiscence, life review, and cognitive stimulation and cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, in addition to that, we, we supply reports and alerts based on activity and engagement that we collect um, off of our appliance. So how does the product work? First, we engage the family, we get them to supply biographical information in our application and share photos, music, and interests. At that point, we curate content and we ship that content to the device. At that point, we, um, we, are, allow we are enabled to uh, perform assessments 
Um, we, we can impart telemental health sessions by connecting family, uh, social workers, and psychiatrists, like I mentioned a, a moment ago, um, and perform interventions in a telehealth, telemental health context. While this is happening, we're collecting data from the appliance. We use the onboard sensors to uh, perform artificial emotion intelligence, um, engagement analysis, um, and, and uh, a gaze detection. So what we're really looking for in our sensors are um, uh, cognitive acuity. Does the subject understand what they're seeing? Are they engaged in the experience? And then we want to, we want to make sure that the analysis of that information is not only shared with the provider community, but also back to the family. So step four, uh, the providers look at any mood and anxiety improvement outcomes. Again, we are in the business of treating anxiety and depression relating to cognitive decline. So seeing any incremental um, improvements in mood, engagement, and anxiety in this population is very key. Um, so we, we supply information back to the provider to help them understand what this, uh, what this process is doing for the subject. And then we ship that information back to the family. We ship happiness moments and engagement moments as we're tracking the reactions that the subjects have with the content they're experiencing on our platform. We're recording that, collecting it, analyzing it. And those happy moments are shipped back to the family reminding the family what worked, what, make the sub, what made the subject happy, at what time. And we also use alerts, reports, and toast notifications to drive that engagement with our app and close that flywheel. What are our customer targets? So our primary customer targets are daughters and sons um, and, and the subsequent family of elderly parents. Um, we also have been working with um, home health management and staff. We just released um, some, some really great early clinical results from one of our alpha customers, Delmar Gardens Enterprises out of St. Louis, Missouri. And so we're targeting both business to consumer, um, uh, the business to consumer market, as well as the business to business market with assisted living, skilled nursing, and other geriatric care providers like geriatric psychologists and psychiatrists. Um, also, we've targeted social workers, and we've been engaged with a few social workers locally to help um, understand more about what the product does, how it can be tucked into their service portfolio, and then how it can essentially be remarketed as part of a, um, a, a referral or distribution network. There is some competition in the space. Any good market has, has good competitors. And for us, competition is just an indicator of, 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 of market readiness and market ripeness. Um, Memory Well is, is, a, is a firm that, that uses, um, uh, uses editorial staff to build, um, to build memory uh, uh, stories. Um, it, it's short, storm uh, short, short form biographical content. Um, they have a primarily a B2B focus. Um, Generation Connect um, is also another competitor. And uh, the incumbent in market that has been in business for quite a long time is a, is a firm based out of Colorado uh, called It's Never Too Late. Problems facing our go-to-market. Um, the, the, the biggest problem to date we have is what will compel people to pay out of pocket. Um, where because this is a new technology, um, because this process is targeted towards a population that that uh, unfortunately isn't very well served by the payer community, we need to understand more about what's going to compel people to pay out of pocket. We also would love more ideas on automation and scale of our content capabilities. We do have some. Um, but more information on that and more ways for us to achieve automation and scale are always very helpful for us. Um, just so everyone knows, we've been looking into synthetic media strategies. So, so as part of our technology roadmap, synthetic media is certainly going to become a, a, a factor as we evolve our, our content curation, uh, automation, and scale. Um, we also are really focused on network effects. So what is going to compel 
continuous adoption and engagement and what is going to drive that flywheel faster and build our network of users so that we're actually returning value um, back to the patients that we're serving. Um, interestingly enough, you know, um, <laughs> Getting the story out has been very difficult, um, and I don't know why that's interesting because actually it's a very hard thing commercializing technology. Um, but we could use some help continuing to get the story out. We just released a press release last week on our early clinical results, and you know we have family members teed up to speak and provide testimonials on our behalf, and we think that earned media angle is a much more cost-effective way of. Of, of trying to get awareness and consideration for our solution. And then, you know, we've spent the last, well, the better part of the fourth quarter of last year, kind of into, you know, February of this year, um, um, working on reimbursement strategies and understanding the payer marketplace in a lot more detail relative to this patient population. And, you know, we have, a there's a lot of work that we have to do uh, in order to even be in a position to be considered a, a reimbursable solution. So those are the four key components that um, I'd like to bring to this audience's attention as, as it relates to our problems. And, and with that, um, that's telememory. Um, thank you guys for um, uh, allowing me to present to your group. And I guess let's open it up for questions. Hey, thanks for the uh, great presentation, Elliot. A uh, couple of questions for you. Are you in St. Louis? Is that is that why you have the test site there? We're in Kansas City. Um, one of our advisory board members, uh, he's a uh, he's the one of the world's foremost geriatric psychiatrists. He's a teaching he's a teaching clinician at St. Louis Health University, and he's got a relationship with Del Mar Gardens Enterprises. So that's where, why our alpha is at in St. Louis. We're in Kansas City, though. Okay. Well, as someone who grew up on a farm outside Kansas City, kudos. Love it. Keep going. Oh, yeah. Where? Uh, just south of uh, Kansas City. Okay. Okay. So, great. <laughs> so the, uh, a question I have for you is, can you elaborate just a little bit more on what those, um, those hurdles are, those things that you would have to put in place to become a reimbursable? Um, yeah, that's a great uh, question. So, organization? so um, uh, the, the pro so so the, the payer market is very dynamic, and um, it, it, within the senior population, right, those over 65 are their their Medicare recipients, and there's two forms of Medicare: Medicare and Medicare Advantage. Medicare requirements um, involve fairly lengthy um, clinical studies, right? So efficacy has to be um, very um, thoroughly. Um, understood and analyzed um, in order for Medicare to consider this something that is uh, of benefit, right, to their to their um, uh, recipients. Um, Medicare Advantage is a little less um, stringent relative to the requirements um, for um, um, for sort of uh, therapeutics and interventions that haven't had a lot of clinical research behind them. But one of the biggest barriers is is gaining, um, uh, essentially performing a clinical study. Now, we've done a, a, an initial clinical study. Um, the scope of the study was too small to be considered uh, for, for, uh, for Medicare. Uh, Medicare typically likes to see subjects in the range of a minimum of 25 patients, uh, 25 um, and up. Um, you know, for statistical significance, and we just simply haven't had the we, we haven't had the scale to be able to perform that study. Now, we've um, we've 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 performed. You know, we we we've got a protocol in place, so so we know what we we need to study, right? Um, we we know. Um, there, you know, a lot of the inputs uh, on the study are already in place. We know that information. It's just a question of like time and money at this point in order to perform that work. And still, that's no guarantee. But, you know, the more research we do, 
um, the more, and, and by the way, there's a ton of peer reviewed research on both cognitive stimulation therapy, various forms of cognitive stimulation therapy for the geriatric population, as well as um, our analog reminiscence therapy, which is a form of cognitive stimulation and cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, but again, this, this, the study data is very limited. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of a long answer to your, to your initial question. I have a question. Do you have any data on how well your product has worked with people with dementia? Like how well did it work on your dad? Did, was he able to have a better relationship and memory and things like that? Yes, we do. Um, um, it was just published last week. Um, and as a matter of fact, I'm presenting a poster at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference in Amsterdam coming up in July 20, 25th, um, where we're going to be presenting the results. So um, the, the net results we found is that it, you know, it, it increased, it improved mood and it decreased depression in subjects that had a propensity for anxiety and depression. Um, and I, I, if anybody's interested, just send me an email and I'll send you a link to the press release because we've got families, we've got practitioners. Uh, Dr. Grossberg is available for an interview because Dr. Grossberg has been overseeing this, uh, this study um, as it's been, you know, um, rolled out. And so, yeah, I, I mean, the results are outsta outstanding. Um, I just went through this, my dad, so I understand exactly what you're doing. I also was a nursing home administrator and a hospital minister for 12 years. So I know where you're going with this. My concerns, um, would be HIPAA compliance because now you're having a machine that's, that's broadcasting into a family's home and broadcasting life into a center, into somebody's room. Um, there's some real iffy stuff there when you're talking about policies and, and compliance because you're broadcasting. Uh, have you addressed that as a company? And yes, we have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah we have we have a, a HIPAA um, compliance. We have a, essentially a HIPAA waiver that we require for every participant. Um, it's part of our user license agreement. Um, and, and it gives us certain rights. Um, this isn't a broadcast uh, scenario. This is a very, this is a narrow cast, closed network um, scenario which we're running on HIPAA compliant um, solutions. So they're cloud-based solutions, but, and, and to be clear, we, we haven't achieved a HIPAA compliant status, right? So we're not certified HIPAA compliant yet, but we've built everything in order for us to attain that status. Now, the waivers that we've asked our early customers to sign help mitigate that risk, um, but, you know, duly noted, I understand exactly what you're talking about. Um, we have a privacy policy that is a requirement for both um, working with Google um, as well as working with Apple. Um, so that privacy policy, you know, we're using their guidelines as a way of, of you know, uh, controlling um, information leak, if you will. Elliot, I'm in your target market demographic. I'm a son of elderly parents as well as uh, even more elderly parents-in-law and think you're definitely um, addressing a problem here. My concern is, would the subject feel like a lab rat? And if so, how do you address that? Well, the, so it's a very passive experience for the senior. That's, and by design. Right, because I mean, we have a hard enough time, even as you know, middle-aged adults, or you know, what do they call it, uh, um, digital migrants. Um, uh, so we have a hard enough time as these digital migrants to figure out how all these buttons and functions work in our in our solutions that we work with every day. So the the experience for the subject is very passive by design, and it's really designed to compel the family to engage with the subject when the subject is showing uh, signs of activity. So a big component of serving this market involves some type of remote monitoring. And just to personalize it a little bit, 
you know, when my father, when we moved my father from Florida to Kansas City to a facility in Kansas City, he was only 11 miles away from us. And it was very difficult for me um, with, you know, my goings on in my family to go out and see him more than once a week. It was just, you know, took me, you know, whatever hour to get out there. And so I couldn't make it part of my day every day. When I wasn't there, the one thing that I wanted to know is that what was, was there activity around my dad? Um, was he up and active or were there people around him? And just the idea of getting that information of, hey, look, there's just, just in the very same way that the ring doorbell works, just being able to have that little kernel of information would, would have just reduced my anxiety a little bit more. And one thing I didn't tell this audience in, in my pitch is that anxiety and depression doesn't only affect the patient or the subject, it also affects the family. So, so we've got this two-fold issue here that we're trying to address. Family members experience just as much anxiety and depression because of the diagnosis as 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 maybe even more than the patient. So, you know, so so being able to build a solution that, and I, I can understand your point. The the, the lab rat um, uh, uh, syndrome we've 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 really worked on the the results that we've gotten from the um, the subjects that we've been working with at Delmar Gardens have been, it's been a, a very fluid experience for them. Um, they just feel like they're working with another gadget. They don't feel like it's intrusive. Um, and it's on their time too. And so hopefully that answers your question. Hi. Um, I was wondering, you said one of your uh, go-to-market hurdles was getting people to pay out of pocket. What exactly is your um, revenue uh, model, and is there like some things you can like something you can do uh, with that to make people more willing to pay? I know. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, incentives. Um, incentives are are key. Right to getting people to to commit to a relationship with with our company, um, our revenue model it works on a two tier subscription model. We have a light uh, tier um, which is thirty dollars a month, and we have a pro tier um, which provides the uh, which provides the families and subjects with telemental health services in addition to um, access to the family app. And then, and then there's a price. There's a, a, a two hundred and ninety nine dollar price point for the hardware, and that's a one time cost. We're working on um, additional tiers for our B two B segment, but right now that's how we've got it priced. Now, we've been thinking about uh, all sorts of incentives for you know driving people to the model. I mean, one of the things that we're experiencing now is you know. I mean, because we're a pre-revenue company, we've got to move from pre-revenue to revenue. And we've got to design all those incentives and offers into attracting those customers. And, you know, it's, like I said, commercialization is hard. <laughs> yeah, and kind of a two-part question and, and, and answer for you. Um, I'm sure you're working at it, but uh, having just looked at placing my, my, we did place my dad, we're looking at placing my mom. Um, some of those centers offer additional benefits to lure, you know, lure you in on the high-end centers. You know, I mean, we're talking $8,000 a month. You know, that'd be nothing to add another 30, 40 bucks. It would have been fine um, because it would have meant something. The other thing, I think you're missing part of your market to assure the program. Uh, because I dealt with mom and dad, mom was fine, dad was not. We could have sold this to mom as just to help her connect with family or a couple as they're moving in. So it transitions with them. You might look at the whole program and say, it's not so much a, uh, for those who need it right now, those who are progressively going toward that or just keeping them from that as, as a wellness type tool. And then you're selling this as a wellness to keep them from becoming more in memory loss. That could be, I mean, that's a bigger threat to, I know, 
I'm over 65. And so, yeah, memory loss, you start saying, well, gee, if I could prevent that, I would invest in that. And maybe a part of your revenues is not so much just going after people who need it right now as people who could need it in the future. Sure. Yeah. Build your model to say, we're going to provide some, some early memory care, some early, so as you go through this process, we can start documenting and helping you. And so the whole program becomes more of a wellness type program. So you're getting people who are even in their homes um, are just, I mean, for example, my folks live in California. I live up here. Yeah. Brothers and sisters live close by, but my other brother lives in Texas. Grandkids live, you know, different places. So the connectivity to say, this is for your memory care. Mm -hmm. um, so people who are, have great cognitive reasoning, no problems. It just keeps them that way. And, and therefore your model comes two tiered. Those who need it now and those who might progressively get there and that could help your revenue model greatly because there's more people who are afraid than there are people who have it. Good point. Yeah, and I just, I think it's more like a suggestion that I have. Um, I, I like what you're doing. I love the product. I have family members that sh suffer from dementia as well. Um, but I can't tell what separates you from your competitors. I know you mentioned them and you had a slide, but I had to read what was like, what's the difference between you and your competitors. So maybe in the future when you present, just make it clear, this is what separates me. This is what makes me special and better than my other competitors. A good, good point. Um, we, we do have that data. It's just didn't make it into this particular presentation, but thanks. That's a good, that's a good point. And, and really, I mean, to speak to that, the, you know, what makes us different is, you know, number one, um, we're using artificial emotion intelligence and computer vision processes to detect cognitive response, um, emotion and engagement, right? That, that's the primary difference. Um, we also, um, so, so, so that's, that's a major difference. We're also providing near real time um, engagement and activity monitoring reports and alerts. So from a tech perspective, those are the key differentiating components that, that sets us apart from those, those three firms that I mentioned prior. 